and to compare them, I'm going to show some a, a few different examples. Uh, so, with switching is a way to deliver data through a network via our intermediate nodes, where those intermediate nodes are switches or switching nodes, and the different ways in which we can uh, set up that path and deliver the data across the path, across the set of switching nodes. And we mentioned on Monday we had circuit switching and packet switching. And circuit switching <coughs> based on, well, developed for telephone networks, so it's, it's been around for a long time, where we set up a connection and that gives us a path all the way from source to destination. And once we set up a circuit, this connection, we can send our signal along there and the in intermediate switching nodes are configured such that the signal effectively passes straight through. So the end result is that with circuit switching it's like having one long link from source through to destination. There's some complexities of multiplexing and so on but that's the end result from the user with circuit switching. Circuit switching works well with a constant amount of data being sent over some period of time because we reserve resources. If you reserve the resources, that is the capacity of the links, the, the, the capabilities of the devices, of the switching nodes, means you're guaranteed to be able to use that capacity when you want to send your data. That's good for your data transfer. But it can be bad in terms of efficiency of the network because you reserve 10 megabits per second but if you only use one megabit per second, one out of ten, then with circuit switching, no one else can use that remaining nine, that spare capacity. So if you reserve it a certain amount in circuit switching, but don't use that, then the rest is wasted. That's the problem with circuit switching. And packet switching tries to overcome that by allowing the unused capacity to be used by others and we do that by breaking the data into packets. <coughs> One, so in, and in packet switching we had two types, we had datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. Coming back to this idea of reservations, one uh, and uh, analogy that people use is to talk about road networks, like the, the roads which we drive on. And circuit switching, consider the case where you have some VIPs travelling from one location to another. So, for example, a member of the ro royal family, some high-ranking politician, what do they do when they need to drive somewhere? They cr close down the road with which those people are going to travel on. Okay, so we have public roads, but when some VIP needs to travel somewhere, then what often happens, and we've all seen it, I think, that uh, in advance the police will, will close down the intersections so the cars can't join that road where the VIPs are going to travel on. And when the VIPs come, then they just travel straight through the, the intersections along the road at, at whichever speed that they're going, 120 kilometres an, an hour or, or whatever, whatever the road enables. So that's maybe we can equate to circuit switching. What happens to get the people from A to B, from source to destination, think of the intersections as the switching nodes. They allow you normally to switch the data into different directions. So what happens is that in advance we configure the intersections so that the data that we're going to send is going to go straight through those intersections. We reserve the road for that specific uh, data transfer for those people. So the, the road is reserved for that uh, transfer of people. What it means is so we set up that connection and when we're waiting for people, to, the VIPs, to travel along that road, no one else can use the road. And you may have to sit and wait at an intersection while someone else has, is, well, the VIPs are travelling through. So no one else can use the road. 
which is good for those people who are the VIPs who are travelling because they can go from A to B with no stops at the intersections, no delay at the switching nodes and transferred at the full data rate. It's bad for the people who have to wait at the intersections while that road is closed down. Okay? So reserving the resources is good for the data transfer, the quality of that data transfer, but bad from other, other people's perspective who cannot use the road when it's unused because it's been reserved. So that's a, a, a case of circuit switching. Maybe a case of, of datagram packet switching would be just you and I need to go from A to B or a group of people, say all the students from SIT need to drive into the city. We just get in our own cars and we drive following our own path. Okay? Someone may take a different path than I take. So our packets, our cars can go in all directions from the same source to the same destination. And of course, when we get to intersections, there may be some delay because other cars are going in other directions. So that delay slows down our, uh, our, our total time to get from A to B. So with packet switching, we send our packets separately representing the data and at the switching nodes, they must be processed, causing some delay. What advantage do we get with packet switching compared to circuit switching though? So what's good with packet switching? We've got a bad thing in terms of we now need to set, send our data in separate packets. What's, what benefit can we get? <coughs> we can be more efficient, especially when the, again, uh, the, the amount of data needs to be sent varies over time. With circuit switching, we reserve the path. No one else can use it while it's reserved. With packet switching, we don't necessarily reserve the path. We send our packets, and what happens is if some people are sending lots of packets, where others are sending a few packets, then if the network is built correctly, then in most cases all of those packets can still be delivered across the path. And at another time when someone's sending very little and another person needs to send a lot, then again by sending individual packets, the switching nodes can combine or, or consider all incoming packets and utilize the output link by sending everyone's packets across that same output link. And that's hard to explain. I've got a tr a another example to try and illustrate that. You don't have this, but just follow along. Here's a simple network. Some, the, the squares are our stations and the circles are our switching nodes. Uh, a simple network. And for the main part, we'll focus on the top one sending to the, the bottom one, uh, the source and destination. Let's consider circuit switching first. What happens? So let's just focus on this path. We've chosen this path. <coughs> In circuit switching, we need to first establish the circuit, set up the path. We send some special message, usually a short message, to the first switching node. When it receives that, it configures the switch in preparation that this, is going to, this circuit's going to be established. Okay, so there's something done at the switch saying, that there's potentially going to be a path from source through to destination passing through this switch. Yeah. And forwards this sometimes called a request message, a call request message, a connection request message to the next switch, which says, OK, there's likely to be a connection from A through to B. And then when the destination receives it, if everything's OK, it sends back a response. It accepts this request and sends back a response sends back a short response saying, I accept this connection. And as that passes through these switches, these switches confirm oh. that we are going to have a connection or a circuit from this source to this destination. And they set themselves up. And we saw in one of those early pictures in the operator of the telephone exchange, they connect this input or this 
line into this line inside the switch. Of course, there's uh, complexities of doing that, but conceptually, we connect those lines together. And the response comes back, and same at this intermediate, at this switching node. It configures to connect this line to this line. This is just the connection setup. Now we have a connection. This is circuit switching. Now we want to send the data. So the source starts sending data. And there's no concept of packets. We just transmit the data that we have. In fact, usually we think about it as a signal. We take our data and we send a signal out of here. And that signal passes all the way through the switching node to the destination. So all right, we start transmitting some data. It comes out of the computer and it keeps coming out. And think of that data in circuit switching simply passes through the switching nodes. Because all the switching node does, because it's already configured, anything coming in here is configured to go directly out here. And simply passes that data through onto the output link. And it passes through the network, through those intermediate links, the switching nodes and is received at the destination. In fact, once we've set up the circuit with circuit switching, you can almost remove these switching nodes and consider this as just one long link. If you want to look at the total delay to deliver that data, well, it depends upon the distance and the speed at which we can send the data, so transmission and propagation delay. There's very little, usually we assume zero, processing delay inside the switches. Because the signal just comes in and goes directly out. Okay, so it's as if the switches are not there once we've set up a circuit. The problem with this is that, although, do I have it? Coming back to our network, we just looked from the top one sending to the bottom one, there may be other stations wanting to send okay, across this network at the same time. The problem with circuit switching, as we said, is that we reserve the capacity. Even if we've set up a connection and A, or the source, is not sending data to the destination at this point in time, no one else can use the resources reserved for that connection. And so it's inefficient from that perspective. Let's look at packet switching, and I'll use virtual circuit packet switching as an example. Same network, but let's consider packet switching in virtual circuit packet switching, we, we simply use packets now and try to behave like circuit switching. So same source and destination, we still set up a path, a virtual circuit, by sending a request saying, I want to connect to this destination, similar to before, <coughs> except <coughs> this request message is processed here and it stores some information that in advance that uh, it's possibly going to be a virtual circuit from source to destination. We accept that request, send back a response. And in fact, the packet switches store in memory some information saying, from now on, anything coming from this source to this destination, if I receive a packet with a source address of this one and the destination address of this one, when I receive a packet, I will send it, for this switch's perspective, send it on this link. Okay? So they store some information to tell them the source address, destination address, and where to send it next. So we set up a path or a virtual circuit, and then we start transferring data. And now we break that data into packets. So we think, okay, the data that the source has to send, we break into three packets to keep it simple, we may have many more. And we send those packets one at a time. There may be some delay between sending the first packet and sending the second packet. Okay? Depends when we have the data available. 
That is, if, if the application generates some data to be sent, then that's the first packet, and then a, a few milliseconds later has some more data to send, maybe that's the second packet. So I'm trying to show that there may be some time between sending those packets. They are sent from the source to the switching node. And the switching node receives a packet. It must process that packet. And at least what it must do is look at the header. I haven't drawn the header, but there's a header for this packet. Inside the header should be the source address and destination address. So what this switching node does in packet switching is looks at the header, sees that the destination is here, and compares to what it stored previously when we set up that connection, and determines, OK, the destination is here. It's coming from this source. I know I must send that in this direction. Not out here, not out here. So it processes, which takes some time. With circuit switching, the processing of the data is almost zero. It's very fast. Of course, the time to process the data depends upon the, or the packet depends upon what's in the packet. But it also, not shown here, there may be packets coming from other directions at the same time. Okay? There may be packets coming into this switch from this direction, from this direction. So, in fact, the time to process that blue packet that arrives depends not only on, on that packet, but on what others are sending. So there may be a large delay there. And then we send it out, and we just send those packets uh, through the network. And because of the varying delay in the, in the switching nodes, this one may, there may be some increased delay or time between the first and the second packet now. So we transmit the first packet. A little bit later, we send the second packet across the link. And in fact, you can think across this link that we're inefficient. We're not transmitting all the time. We're transmitting the first packet, and then there's some delay before we send the second packet. We'd like to be sending packets all the time across the link. And then we deliver them eventually to the de destination. Let's consider now, in our network, we have another virtual circuit set up from this source to this destination this red one. It's been set up already. I won't go through the setup process. And the source, the red one wants to send several packets or two packets through to the destination. In the same way with packet switching, it generates the packets, transmits them, and at a similar time, our blue source starts transmitting its packets, and they arrive, they start to arrive at this first, first switching node at the same time. The red ones and the blue ones come into the switching node on two different links. So the switching node looks, looks at the headers, sees who is the source, who is the destination, and determines, in fact, in this case, it needs to send them all out on this link. And in fact, the benefits of packet switching arise now in that even if there's a small amount of data coming from one, we can combine what we send out on this link, we can combine the packets from both the sources. So we can transmit, let's say, the first packet from the blue one, then the red packet, then a blue packet, and so on. So from this output link, we're actually transmitting packets all the time, or very close to, there's a small gap here. That's more efficient utilization of that link because when I just had the blue one transmitting, we saw there were some gaps here when we transmitted across this link. But if there's someone else also wanting to send packets, then if we're lucky, what can happen is that we can get to transmit all those packets one after another across this output link, fully utilizing the link. That's good. If I have some link, I want to be sending across it all the time, because if I'm not, that's inefficient. So it works out in most cases with packet switching because sources have different amounts of data to send. 
In some instant, the blue source has a lot of packets to send. The red one has a little, a few packets. And then maybe a second later, the blue one has just a few packets to send. The red one has many packets to send. Then they send those packets. And if they need to traverse the same link, then if our network is built well and designed well, then usually we can be sending packets all the time across this link. Sometimes we're sending a lot of the blue packets and a few red ones. Other times we're sending a lot of the red packets and a few blue ones. But again, fully utilizing that link or increasing the utilization, increasing the efficiency. The second switching node simply receives a packet, looks at the header, determines where to send it. The red ones it knows need to go in this direction, the blue ones in this direction. And they're delivered to the destination. Okay. So this is an example of virtual circuit packet switching. The same concepts apply with datagram packet switching, except we don't set up a connection in advance. But we still have an advantage of, by using packets, smaller chunks of data, than when users are sending a lot and some other users are sending very little, we can combine their data and efficiently utilize the links and, and overall efficiently utilize the, the entire network. With circuit switching, if a user reserves a connection but sends very little, then what they're not using is wasted, and that's inefficient. And that's really the summary of uh, those three switching techniques. Okay, I don't show datagram packet switching here. It's a, the same as the blue and red one, except we don't have a, a path set up in advance. Maybe the packets take different paths. It's possible with datagram packets, which you Any questions on these three switching techniques? Let's go back to our lectures. Let's compare the three from the perspective of how long it takes to transfer the data. <coughs> circuit switching on the left, virtual circuit packet switching in the middle, datagram packet switching on the right. And it's showing that the, de the total delay or the total time to transfer data. In the first two cases, we need to set up a connection. There's slightly different ways in, in with which that's performed. But the basic approach is that we send a request, a short request message from source to destination, which responds with some, in this case, a call accept or a connection accept request, a message. And similar with virtual circuit packet switching, we send some call request packet and responds with a call accept packet, saying we accept, we're prepared to receive the data. Whereas with datagram packet switching, we don't do this connection setup. We just send the data immediately. There's no delay of setting up this connection at the start with datagram packet switching. For the data transfer, with, data, with circuit switching, we don't have packets. We just transmit the data. And we can think the data just goes through each switch until it's received by the destination. So there's no delay inside the switches, or very, very small delay. So you can think that, OK, we have one piece of data. We transmit it. This is the transmission delay. There's some propagation delay. The propagation de delay of the path is really the propagation, or the sum of the propagation delay of each of the links. Okay. If it takes 10 milliseconds to propagate from the cross each link, then it takes 30 milliseconds to propagate across the path. But when we use packet switching, we transmit a packet one at a time. And the switching node will not transmit on the output link until it's fully received that packet and processed it by looking at the header. So we see we transmit a packet. It's received at this point. 
there may be some small processing delay, and then we transmit packet one on the second link. It's received and transmitted across the third link. And similar with packets two and three. And we see that with virtual circuit packet switching and datagram packet switching, the data transfer phase is the same. There's no difference there. Which one's fastest? Which one takes the least time to transfer our data? In this case, we see datagram packet switching is fastest. Is it always? All right. It depends. Good. Compare these two. Depends. Data. De compare datagram packet switching with virtual circuit packet switching. Under the same conditions, datagram packet switching is always faster. Because the only difference is that, assuming we have the same amount of data, the same size packets, this time is the, the same as this time. But with virtual circuit packet switching, we have an additional time to set up the connection. So my computer wants to send data with virtual circuit packet switching at time zero. I want to send data. What happens first is I send a request, get back a response, and then send the data. So there's this extra delay of setting up the virtual circuit always with virtual circuit packet switching. Now, so datagram packet switching has a smaller delay than virtual circuit packet switching. What about then circuit switching versus datagram packet switching? Which one takes less time? Or what does it depend upon? Okay, good. It depends upon the size of the data. And roughly, under the same conditions, well, what's the delay for datagram packet switching? Yeah, a time to transmit data, but also we have this delay of headers inside the packets. We have to transmit them. And we have this delay that we cannot transmit the first packet until we've fully received it. So there's some delay there delay inside the switching nodes which is not present in the data transfer for circuit switching. In circuit switching, no header, just send the data all the way through. So the data transfer phase of circuit switching will be faster than that with the packet switching techniques. But circuit switching has this additional delay at the start of setting up the connection. So which one is faster? Well, it would depend upon how much data we need to transfer. Because if you can imagine that the data, we have a lot of data to transfer. That is, if I drew this again, the data to transfer went all the way down there. Then the time to set up the connection is just a small percentage of the total time. Whereas with packet switching, if we have many, many packets to send, there's a lot of overhead of headers. So circuit switching, the total time can be less in that case. So it depends upon the, the, the amount of data normally. If we have a lot of data to send, setting up a connection is not so much of a problem. But if you only have a small amount of data to send, then setting up a connection is, is a waste of time. That's the general trade-off. In the internet, most of our applications today, we often send, think of web browsing. We send a, a short request and then receive a response. We may access the same web server again or we may access other web servers. So it generally doesn't make sense to set up a connection just to transfer, a, say, a single packet to a server, get a single response back and then close that connection because the overhead of setting up the connection is quite significant. And in fact, in the internet, datagram packet switching is used. 
and in most networks. And there are some cases where virtual circuit packet switching is used in, in wide area networks, but in general for the internet, especially from the perspective of the internet protocol which we'll cover, datagram packet switching is the technique chosen. This compares the three switching techniques. Uh, some of them we haven't discussed and will not. You can read through. Let's just highlight some of the main trade-offs between the three. Circuit switching, we set up a, a dedicated transmission path. That is, we set up a, a circuit from source to destination and it's reserved for that data transfer. There's a path. That is, there's a physical connection from source through to destination is not the case with packet switching. Even in virtual circuit packet switching, although we set up a virtual circuit, we're processing packets one at a time. We don't have a, a physical path from source to destination reserved. All right, packet switching, transmission of packets. Uh, which routing we'll return to later, so we'll talk about routing. Okay, with the del delay circuit switching and virtual circuit packet switching have a some setup delay, call setup delay. There's small transmission delay, almost zero, with at their switching nodes with circuit switching, but with this packet switching techniques, we have this delay of transmitting a packet. That's larger than for circuit switching. Uh, what happens if things go wrong? Um, if, if in circuit switching we try to connect to a destination and that destination is busy, then we may get some response back saying the destination is busy. Uh, we don't have that concept. In datagram packet switching, we may send data. It may not be delivered. We may get some notification our data wasn't delivered. And similar to circuit switching, virtual circuit packet switching, we may try and connect. It's possible that the destination says, no, I cannot set up a connection, deny the connection. Importantly, what happens when we have a lot of data, a lot of information to send across the network? With, with circuit switching, and we gave the example yesterday, if our resources are reserved and someone else wants to make a phone call, that phone call is blocked. It's not set up. So we have the concept of call blocking in circuit switching. It may be the same in virtual circuit packet switching. We, if we have some measure of resources, we try to set up a new connection, then we may have to block that connection. But importantly, with packet switching, as more people send data, what normally happens is that inside our switches, as more people are sending data, there's a larger delay inside these switching nodes. Because if the blue one is sending data in and everyone else is also sending data into this switching node, the switching node can only process one packet at a time and therefore others will have to wait or queue. They'll have to wait in a queue for the first packet to be sent. So the delay at the switching nodes increases as the amount of data needed, needed to be sent increases in packet switching. The queuing delay increases. Uh, something about the size of the nodes, not so important for us. Um, this one, the second to last one, is, is key. In circuit switching, we have a fixed, the word used here, bandwidth, but fixed resources allocated for the data transfer. With packet switching, we dynamically use those resources, the bandwidth, the capacity. Fixed is good from the perspective of the people who want to send data, they get guaranteed performance, but it's bad in terms of network efficiency when those people vary the amount of data they want to send. That's why dynamic use of the resources is better for efficiency.
And that's all I want to cover on, on switching. The way to get data from across a network from source to destination. The one thing that we skipped when we talked about networks is we said that we send data across some path, across a set of links. We often have multiple different paths to choose from. How do we choose which path to use? And that's our next topic, routing. How do you choose to, the path to take from, one so, from the source to the destination? I want to drive from here into the center of Bangkok, go shopping at Paragon, okay? What path do I take? I'm sure many of you have driven in, into some places in Bangkok. How, which path do you take? How do you drive into Bangkok or your friends? Expressway. Expressway, why? Expressway. It's the fastest way. Okay, if, if we have, so one way to choose the path to take, there are many paths, of course. To drive into, say, Paragon, then there are many different roads we could take, many different paths we could take. So how do we choose which one to take? Well, one criteria we could use is, uh, well, there are, in some cases, there are expressways or highways which we, you can use, or toll roads. Let's use them because they don't have so many intersections and in general the cars can travel faster. Okay. I'm, I'm a cheap person, I don't want to spend money on a toll road. What else can I do? Yes. Um, we're driving, okay, let's stay with driving. I, I'm cheap, I've got no money. I'm a no, 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 not go up. Don't go up, go under the tollway. Okay, in some, some parts there's, there's a road uh, but that, that, no, that road is not always present from here into Paragon, then sometimes we have to take some side roads. How do I choose which ones to take then? Why not, I don't know, here we are at SIT and here's uh, Bangkok, why not drive up and out and out to the, uh, to the east and, and come down there? How, how do I choose the, the path to take? You're going to want to take the shortest path and the path. Shortest path. Shortest path. Shortest path in what? Uh, well, <coughs> Measured in it what? It could be the distance or speed. Okay, one, one way to measure. It have to be the same. Yeah, one way, the shortest distance. Okay, I've got a map. Okay, I've got Google Maps here. Accurate. What I can do is get a ruler and measure, okay, what's the actual distance from A through to B? And, and scale that up to kilometers, okay? And then we'll look at individual sections of roads. As we come up to an intersection, we may have to turn and work out, okay, what's the distance if I take this path? 40 kilometers. Okay, if I take a different path, it's 45 kilometers. Okay, choose the path with the least distance. There's one way. Does it always work? No. Why not? Okay. Traffic. Sometimes at some of the intersections, there's a lot of traffic. That is, there's cars coming from on your direction, from the opposite direction, and, and from the s side directions. Which means at that intersection, I must stop at the stoplights and wait for three minutes. So the more traffic on that path, the longer delay I'm going to have. So it may be another way to choose a path would be to select a path which has no traffic or very little traffic, the least traffic. Let's have a look at 
so these are some of the results that, that Google Maps returned uh, this morning. The first path is, it showed me here. Uh, here it says the distance, 31.4 kilometers. So let's say that's the distance of each of the segments, the road segments, if we take this blue line. The normal time, 30 minutes. So Google has done some calculation that maybe, okay, if we travel at normal speed across each of those road segments, the time it would typically take is 30 minutes. But it gives me a, a bit more information. In current traffic, this was 8 a.m. this morning, it says 46 minutes. Okay, Google is a little bit smarter than just taking the, the time in, to be the same. It has some information about the current traffic conditions. So, and then it actually has three options of paths. The second option, distance of 32.6 kilometers, typical time 36 minutes, current one hour, five minutes, a different path. And then this one, 39.5 kilometers, further, larger distance, 56 minutes current time, less than the second one, if we consider the, the traffic. And a fourth one, I select the option here, avoid the tolls. I don't have the money. It gives me some options and here was one, distance 35 kilometers, current time 58, normal time 41 minutes. In, in our road network, we need ways to choose the path to take to get from A to B. In our computer network, our communications network, we also need ways to choose the path to take from source station to destination station via those switching nodes. Which links do we go by? The, the general uh, process is called routing. We need to choose a route or choose a, a path. So we have algorithms to choose the best route. And when I say best, well there are different criteria for measuring best. And we've just mentioned some of them. The distance in terms of kilometers. Well, same can be applied for com communications network. Choose a route for my data to go from here through to uh, the US. Well, maybe there's paths that go up via Tokyo. There's one to Singapore and, and through Southeast Asia, across the Pacific. Maybe there's another path that goes via Europe. Choose the path which has the least distance. And there's one criteria for choosing a path through a network. Coming back to our road network, Google has calculated some typical times. Okay, 31 kilometers, going back to our first one. 31.4 kilometers, 30 minutes typical time, but in current traffic, 46 minutes. If I go back and look at the map now, so this was at 8 a.m. Look at it now, it's 9.30, 10 a.m. The distance, is it going to be the same? Yeah. Yes, the distance doesn't change for this path. The typical time will probably be the same because I think that's the time that uh, is calculated based upon the distance and, and the road speeds. In current traffic time, most likely will be different, okay, because now uh, past 9 a.m. maybe there's less traffic on the roads and they calculate it to be say 40 minutes not 46 minutes. Choosing the best path of course we have different criteria for choosing the best path like distance, uh, amount of traffic, cost, do we avoid the toll or not? But another thing that's important is in some cases, the information that we use to choose the best path, how up to date it is. Okay, so in this case, the 30 minutes time is probably a time that is typical with very little traffic. But Google is getting responses. How do they get it? Well, maybe they get it from traffic reporting stations, from from uh, the the city. Uh, traffic cameras get some information about where the congestion is and that feeds back in and then it updates the, the current traffic time. Okay. I don't know how often it updates 
maybe every 30 minutes, every one hour. It may depend upon where the information comes from. Yeah, okay, for, for, from, from users, information from users and where they are. So there's different sources for where that information may come from. The, the rate at which we get updates will help us choosing the best path. Because if we update this in current traffic every one minute, it's an accurate representation of the current traffic. There's a traffic jam five minutes ago at one intersection which increases this from 46 minutes up to 50 minutes, then that may, me, may allow me to choose a better path. So the more, more frequently we get updates of what's happening in the network, the more, more chance I can choose the best path. If this in current traffic updated once per day, it wouldn't be very useful because during a day, during that 24 hours, the traffic varies a lot. The congestion varies in different locations. So the frequency of the updates is very important. And the, the source of that, those updates, where did the information come from? Did it come from different points in the network? Uh, and what cost was involved of collecting that information is important. All right, we said, we may want to choose a path which has low cost, low financial cost, another criteria. So that's an example for road networks. The same applies with communication networks. And that's our topic on routing. How do we choose a route through a switched communication network? And from now on, we're going to focus on packet-based networks, packet switching. But the same similar concepts for routing also apply for circuit switching. But the examples we'll use will be for packet switching. <coughs> Here's our network from before. So to get from A through to D, which path or route do we take? So we use the word path or route to mean the same thing here. That's the problem that we're trying to solve. What's the best path from A through to D? Well, the answer, choose the best path. Okay. Well, then we need to define, well, what do we mean by best? What criteria do we have to define best? Of course we want the best path, but what do we mean by that? So what do we mean by best? How to choose that? Note that we, in our example, with six stations, with seven switching nodes, there are several paths here. There are not many to choose from. Not a difficult problem to choose the best path in this case. But in a real network across a country, between countries, even within cities, the number of devices, stations, switching nodes, links, it can be very high. So the connectivity is uh, much more complex than the examples we'll see. And in fact, you cannot easily just look at the picture of the network and choose the best path. You need some algorithms to calculate it for us. So what do we mean by best and how do we choose the best path once we define best? What algorithms do we have available? When there are many possible paths, choose the best one. We're going to focus on routing and packet switch networks, but it's the same essentially in, in circuit or packet switch networks. So coming back, we'll see that we need to define what is best and we need a, some algorithm to choose the best path, a routing algorithm. Some general requirements of some routing algorithm needs to be correct. So a routing algorithm takes as an input the source and the destination and returns as an output the best path between source and destination. So if the source is A, the destination is B, a routing algorithm must return a path between A and B. It cannot return a path from A to C. That would be incorrect. That's almost obvious. Okay? We don't want a routing algorithm that doesn't get us to the destination. It should be simple. OK? 
okay, because we'll see that we need to implement this routing algorithm in different nodes. We must do some processing. Uh, simplicity is a way towards getting things which are easy, few errors when we implement, and cheap. The algorithm needs to choose a path from source to destination. Some other requirements should be robust. That is, the, the example of robustness is that we choose a path from A to B, and then we notice the network, there are some errors or there are problems in the network, then we should be able to adapt and choose a better path if it becomes available. So do some ad adaptation as, as the network operates. So even when things are not working well, when we have errors, it should still work. Stability is almost a conflicting requirement with robustness. Stability says that we don't want to switch between paths too frequently. I have a path from A to B and I'm using that path to send my data. And then another path becomes available which is a slightly better than the current one. And we switch to use that other path and start sending the data there. But then the previous path becomes better again because the network conditions are changing, so I switch back to that previous path. And I keep switching between paths and sending my data sometimes on this path, sometimes on another path. That can become a problem because our data uh, can start to be reordered and we have different delays on each path. We can say we get an unstable path. We keep changing paths. We want to select the best path, but we don't want to switch between paths too often. And it depends upon our, our requirements of our applications as what is too often. But stability, don't change paths too often. Robustness, change paths when needed to overcome errors or problems. We need some trade-off between those two. Choose optimal paths. Okay, we've said that. Choose the best path. Efficiency. We'll come back to fairness. Efficiency. The process of choosing a path we'll see requires exchanging some information across the network. Uh, in the, the, the process of the process of Google Maps selecting these three best paths. What did it need to know? It needed to know the map of the, the streets. It needed to know information about the, uh, the speeds on, on along each of the roads that you can travel on. And importantly, it needed to know something about the current traffic conditions. So it could give an estimate of, at this point in time, how long will it take. Now, to collect information about the current traffic conditions, there's some overhead because somehow we need to collect that information. We want to minimize that overhead in collecting information. But still we want to have up-to-date information. So efficiency is about when we collect all the information to determine our path, we want to minimize the amount of processing we do when we collect that information and also mini minimize the amount of overhead that we transmit across our network. But still, choose the best path. Okay, so there are, again, some trade-offs here. We cannot just say, don't collect any information because it may mean we don't choose the best path. Fairness is a hard one uh, to... to given an example, uh, it may turn out in some cases with routing algorithms that some stations can get better paths than others. Which means if station A to, to D always gets, the routing algorithm always chooses a better path than what station C to, to F gets, then it's unfair for one pair of source destination. So there can be extreme cases of that where a routing algorithm gives us is efficient, robust and stable, but it may mean that for some sources 
their traffic always, or their data always goes across very long paths and takes a long time. But for others, it takes a short time across uh, very good paths. So we want to avoid that and try and treat all stations the same and be fair amongst them. I think we'll see examples of well, uh, op optimal paths, efficiency especially, and these two as we go through, we will not see an example of fairness. So we want some algorithm that will choose a path from A to B which meets these requirements. Let's introduce some terminology so we can give some examples. <coughs> we have links between nodes. So now we talk about nodes, switching nodes, or just simply nodes. We have a link between them. Is it a direct connection between them? Uh, actually, let's explain them on this example. Here are six, six switching nodes. Okay, there may be stations attached to them. But let's say we have a network of six switching nodes, N1 through to N6. We have links between those switching nodes. So there's a link from N1 to N4. There's also a link from N4 to N1. Okay, often we have links in both directions. A link is a direct connection between two nodes. A path or a route is a connection between two nodes which may have one or more links. So a path, give me a path from N1 to N4. Well, a path from N1 to N4 is direct. That's one path. Any others? N1 to N4. Give me one example. Okay, there are many others. N1, N2, N4, that's a path. So usually we define a path by the, the set of nodes we traverse. So the path from, there are multiple paths from N1 to N4, N2, N1, N2, N4, N1, N4, N1, N3, N4, and others. Okay, so they are paths. They may contain one or more links. To traverse one link is to uh, make one hop. So we talk about, we often measure hops, talk about hops. This is one hop. To go from N1 to N6 on the path 1, 4, 5, 6, there are three hops. So we we'll often talk about hops, the number of links we traverse along that path. What do we got? Next, a neighbor. Uh, so we a neighbor of a node is the node which are, are the other nodes which this node has direct connections to that has links to. N1 has three neighbors. The neighbors of N1 are N2, N3, and N4, because N1 has links to those three nodes. Okay, so we have neighbors, and for each link we assign some cost. And they are the numbers shown on these arrows. So the arrows are the links, the numbers are the costs of those links. The costs of sending data across that link. Now here, cost does not mean financial cost. It's a general cost. We have to define what it means. So when we say the cost to send from N1 to N4 is 1, and to send from N1 to N2 is 2, well, it doesn't mean one baht, two baht. It may mean a financial cost, but in general it may mean uh, to do with many different metrics. Delay, uh, uh, throughput. Uh, we'll, we'll see more metrics as we go through. So we generally, we assign some general cost to the links. The cost may be different in each direction. Okay, it's possible. So it costs one unit to send to N4, but for N4 back to 7, it costs 7 units. So it's possible. Uh, and a topology, when we talk about a network topology, it's the arrangement of those nodes and links. This is one network topology. If I removed this link here, that would be a different network topology. 
If I added another node and some links, that's a different network topology. It's the arrangement of links and nodes. What our routing algorithm should do is, or what we generally do in routing, is find the least cost path from source to destination. From N1 to N6, the least cost of a path is the sum of the cost of the links on that path. So that's what we define. So each link has a cost. The cost of a path is the sum of the cost of the links along that path. What's the least cost path from N1 to N4? There are multiple paths. Give me one least cost path. This is an easy one. The direct link from N1 to 4, the link cost is 1, the path cost is 1. If we went N2, N4, the path cost would be 2 plus 2 would be 4. Okay? We want to choose the path with the, with the least cost. There may be more than one in some cases. From N1 to N6, least cost path. N1, N4, N5, N6 has a cost of 1 plus 1 plus 2 is 4. From N6 to N1, maybe, are you sure? You actually need to check all the paths. It's not obvious. So, no, the six to three to four one. I think from it's something from N six to N four, if you went five four sorry, N six to N one, six five four one has a cost of four plus one plus seven is twelve. Another path, mm -hmm. six to five to four to two to one has a cost of four plus one plus two, which is seven plus 3 is 10. Any lower cost paths than 10? No. 6 to 5 to 3 has a path of 5 and then to N1 is 13. Okay. It's not obvious to choose the least cost path here. Even with such a simple network, one of the smallest networks you'll see, Right, you cannot just look at it and choose the least cost path. Imagine the network now has a hundred nodes, thousands of links, many possible paths. So we need some algorithm to calculate the least cost path. What is an algorithm that you know? You've done it before, most of you have, I know. You remember, maybe Dr. Bun Dr. Bunyarit may have taught or someone else in first or second year? Dijkstra's algorithm. So there are different algorithms that, given this information, I follow some steps and will always find the least cost path. Dijkstra algorithm is one, Bellman Ford is another algorithm. So there are different algorithms to take the network topology, the cost information, and will return the least cost paths. Okay. We're not going to cover those algorithms. Most of you have, have covered them before in earlier courses. But we'll uh, accept that Right, there are some algorithms that can do it for us. We don't have to manually do it. it we can calculate it. A, a computer can compute it. So, our aim, given some topology, choose a route, choose a path with the least cost. That's easy if we have this topology. Then we apply some algorithm and it returns the answer. Let's come back to some things. Well, where do the, uh, what performance criteria do we use to select the path? Where do those numbers of the costs come from? Okay. So there are, different, there are different ways to select. So there are different sources of those numbers. The number could mean a financial cost. It could mean something related to delay of that link, throughput, and in fact, it can be other things like uh, 
associated uh, some cost to do with the security of using that path. Okay, so there are different performance criteria that we can use. When is a path selected? That is, okay, I have some data, I have a packet to send. Do I select a path for every packet that I want to send? Or do I select a path every day? Every year? Okay, so there are different choices there and they have some impacts on performance. Which nodes are responsible, responsible for selecting the path? Which nodes select the path? Okay. Is it the source node that chooses a path all the way through to the destination? Or maybe all nodes are involved in choosing the path from source to destination? Or maybe there's one central node, some special server that tells us the best path. Okay, so again, different options. Which nodes provide information about the network status? So, if these costs, these numbers here, are to do with the current delay across a link or a portion of the network, they may change over time. Okay? The, the delay may vary over time. It may depend upon the delay at, at nodes even. Okay? So the delay of a link, we may count processing, transmission, propagation, and even queuing delay. So the, if the, the cost varies over time, then we should, to choose the best path, get some update about the current value. Well, which nodes provide that updated information? Which nodes provide information about the current costs, the current usage of the network, even the topology? The topology may change. Today I have six nodes. Tomorrow there's a new node added to the network. So we need to get that information about the new topology so that we can the, uh, calculate the best path. And how often do we get that information? That's important. So we need to answer these questions or at least we need to look at different ways for addressing these questions. And this slide gives some answers to some of those questions. And we'll, we'll discuss them to finish today. Performance criteria. How do we... <coughs> what does this number 1, 7 and so on, what do these costs represent? Well, they can represent different things. Number of hops. So a simple cost metric that we can use is number of hops. So in fact, if we use number of hops, each link would have a cost of one. Okay, on our diagram, all links are cost of one, and then we'd choose a path with the least number of hops. That's a very simple way, and commonly used in some networks. Another criteria may be financial cost. Choose the path which is going to be cheapest for us to send our data because there's a financial cost of sending data across links, especially if you're connecting across multiple different, uh, multiple, if you're connecting across networks operated by different companies. Okay, so there may be some cost of using their network, so consider that when you choose the path. Delay is another common one. Choose the, or assign cost to links which represent the delay of sending our data across that link. Because in many applications, to send data from source to destination, we care about minimizing the delay. Okay, choose the path which gives us the shortest time to transfer or to, to send a single message from A to B. And so the, the delay of the link to do with transmission, propagation, queuing and processing delay is commonly used. Another one may be throughput. I care about transferring a lot of data across the link, from so across the path from source A to destination B. Then if we can assign costs which are related to the throughput, choose a path which gives us the highest throughput. Okay. So 
So there, they are examples of some performance criteria that we use to assign cost to links. We need some way to get a number, a cost to a link. Once we've get, got that, we can use an algorithm to calculate the least cost part. There are others. Uh, one may be uh, security, maybe political factors. Consider routing through, throughout the world. You have a company in two different countries, and it's the laws of that, those, well, the, one of the countries you're operating in, so you cannot send uh, confidential data via some third country, okay, because of political factors. Okay? So in that case, you could potentially choose a route that bypasses a country, or bypasses some region because you don't consider that region to be secure, you don't trust it, for example. So there are other factors that can be used here, but these are the common ones. When is a path selected? Well, commonly, if we're using datagram packet switching, per packet is one option, but in fact the, pa the path may not change across multiple packets. So when we want to send an individual packet, we use some information to determine who to send it to. If we're using virtual circuit packet switching per session or, or when we, whenever we set up the connection, then in the process of setting up the connection, we choose a path and then all of our packets belonging to that session or connection follow that same path. So some examples of when do we choose? When we want to send a packet or belonging to a, packets belonging to an entire session. Which nodes are responsible for selecting the path? So the decision place. All three basic approaches. Each node plays a role. So some distributed approach where all nodes uh, take, have a say in which path is used. Back to our example, if N1 has some information, so one approach could be, okay, let's simply send, uh, if, if we have calculated least cost paths, then N1 knows the least cost path to N6 is via 4, then what N1 does is sends the packets to 4. N4 knows the destination is 6, and if N4 knows that the least cost path to 6 is to 5, then it sends to 5. So each node is having a role in choosing where to send the packet. And each node needs to collect information to find out what is the least cost path. So a distributed approach where all nodes have, have a role. Another approach could be a centralized approach where there's one special computer, maybe not shown here, some central server that calculates the least cost paths and is used whenever we want to send data. Maybe that's suitable in small networks. What was the other one? Source. Originating node. The source node chooses the path. And an example may be, okay, the source chooses the best path is N one, four, five, six, and it sends a packet. And inside that packet, it includes the path information. So in the, in the header, it says this packet must traverse four, five, and go to six. So it sends it to four. Four, all it does is reads the packet and follows the packet instructions, which says send to five. So that's a, an example of the path is chosen by the source, and the other nodes along the way just follow the information, the path that was chosen by the source. So source routing is possible. Let's briefly mention the last two and, and then we'll uh, finish. And, uh, let's give a couple of examples. Where does the information about the network come from? Assuming the costs may change over time. So at this point in time, the costs are this. Five minutes later, the costs of some of the links may have changed. 
In that case, to choose the best path, we would need to collect that information about the updated, updated costs. So where does that information come from? Where does the updates come from? Well, sort of the worst case is don't collect any information. Or don't, uh, yeah, don't collect any information. Local means, so we, we don't have any source of information, none. The best case would be all nodes. Any updates at each node is made available to every other node and all links. But there are some intermediate cases. For example, use just local information. Local, for example, the information local to N1, N1 should know about its links. N1 doesn't know about the links to node 6, but the links connected directly to N1 and the costs of those links would say is local to N1. So if this link changes from cost 2 to cost 5, N1 knows about that if we consider local information. If the link from 5 to 6 changes from 2 to 20, N1 doesn't know about that immediately. It's not local information. It would need to somehow collect or, or someone would need to send that information to it. So if you just use local information, it's quite easy because you always have access to that. Adjacent node, that is neighbor node. What we could do is that, okay, N1 knows about its links. The neighbors of N1, being 2, 3, and 4, they know about their links. They could send some information to N1 about their links. So the link from 4 to 5 changes from 1 to 10, the cost link, the cost of that link. N1 doesn't immediate, immediately know about that change because it's not connected. But if N1, N4 sends a message to N1 saying, my link from 4 to 5 has changed from 1 to 10, then now N1 knows about that change. So if we can collect information from our neighbor nodes, we can learn more about the changes in the network. And the best case is to connect, collect information from all nodes. Every node, every one minute, sends a special message to N1 saying, these are my current links. As a result, N1 has an updated view of the network. So there are trade-offs with each of those. Let's stop now. What we're going to do next week, we'll come back and look at these network information source, network information update timing, and look, talk about the trade-offs, and give a few more examples with our, exam with our simple network of how these may work. Okay, so we'll go some, through some examples. Um, what happens when the costs change, how often we can update, and where do we get that information from. We'll continue that next week.